good afternoon, everybody. I will try to, to be quick so that we have lots of time for questions. Uh, I'm going to discuss today about the work, the work that we are doing uh, in Berkeley University supporting the, uh, the Sure Fund project. And uh, for this seminar, we decided to, to discuss a bit of how the, uh, the concept of uh, the constructions of a dynamic perspective that is usually used in, in business uh, administration can, can be applied to, to resilience management and uh, what can we learn from it. So the, 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 the purpose of the paper, the objective of the paper is to explore potential benefits of adopting this, uh, this perspective uh, to the resilience management process. Um, look into our framework, while we, we mainly focus on farms and other actors, uh, the environmental and economic aspect of it, uh, not really the social institutional one. Uh, in this case, we focus a lot on private goods, we didn't touch the public ones, and uh, we, we look at resilience capacities as a whole, uh, in terms of robustness, adaptability, and transformability uh, as a framework for the analysis. And, um, and well, in terms of uh, some of the attributes, I think we, we will touch in terms of openness of the system, uh, system reserves, and uh, tightness of feedbacks. <coughs> so, uh, resilience management is defined in the literature as the active modification of a system with a specific uh, goal to, to improve its capacity to absorb and adapt to change. Well, we know that. There pretty much two goals. One is prevent this, the system from transitioning into undesirable configurations. That doesn't mean preventing the system from transform, but preventing the system to transform in something that is not what we want. And uh, I think the second one, and it's probably the one that we will focus on, or the one that we want to focus today in, in this presentation, is to cultivate the conditions that facilitate a system adaptability following massive change. And this is, I think, we were we were listening uh, in some presentations before that we were, uh, you know, the importance of learning, the importance of uh, gaining understanding of how our system work, and trying to to use this understanding to improve our chances of a successful adaptation. Um, uh, why a, a dynamic perspective? So, well, I think all of us, uh, every time that we look at resilience and we try to define resilience, and we have to try to explain it to others, we, we face this difficulty that resilience is open and is a kind of loose concept. Uh, so, we think that in order to, one way to approach this is to use constru constructs. So these uh, theoretical constructs help us to bound the object and, and talk about it like if you know, we know what, what actually is it kind of limited. So, uh, uh, and, and this is what a dynamic perspective, that's how it's called in, in the business management uh, domain, uh, is. It's pretty much a series of constructs that help us to make sense of something that otherwise would be a very open concept. Uh, the three reasons why we think it could be useful is because aggregate relations among uh, system components, so reduce detailed complexi complexity, that is having many different elements, and focuses on dynamic complexity, that is the complexity of the interactions between those elements. Uh, it's focused on outcomes as an indicator of performance, so it, it gives us something tangible to talk about, mm -hmm. and, uh, something that we can observe, how, how does it change, that we can try to measure, or at least try to assess, because it's something more tangible than the overall concept of, of the system. And uh, it also focuses on control variables, or slow variables, that is a concept in uh, ecological systems resilience, and uh, that's why I have that chart there that you are probably familiar with, that is that slow variables are these variables that in ecological systems change slowly, but that govern the, the fast variable's behavior and particularly determine or define the domains of attraction or where the system is going to, or where these fast variables are going to, to around, around where these variables are going to perform. So you probably have seen this, this chart. It's uh, quite known from uh, Schiffer and Campbell and I think Walker also uses it a lot. Um, so we think to be we are going to use this in, uh, in the context of our, our sure fund project. Um, we propose to use it to, by focusing on the behavior of some outcomes, of some uh, 
essential functions that we have uh, discussed before in the short form framework, and those are well, uh, public and private uh, functions. And, uh, and we focus on the response on, or, or the behavior of those, um, of those outcomes after they have been affected by a disturbance. And uh, well, we can look at those behaviors in terms of stability, robustness, adapting capacity, or transformation, as novel framework uh, proposes. Um, so to do that, we, we, we use a conceptual model, a very high level and aggregated model, again, not trying to focus on detailed complexity, uh, but trying to well, focus instead on dynamic complexity. And uh, you know that we, this is a simplified representation of how the model looks like. Uh, actually, what we concentrated today was just in a very simple, very small model that just will help us to explain uh, the analysis. So the, the paper is not focused on the model, it's focused on, on the analysis and, the, and try to understand well, what can we gain or how can this dynamic perspective and these constructs can help us to, to, yeah, to, to gain a different perspective in our analysis. Um, this is pretty much the model, uh, well, some bits and pieces missing, pretty much is livestock uh, production drives uh, profits and profits. If, if we have a lot of profits, we decide to, that we want to have more livestock, and that is profits driving growth. Uh, but the more livestock we have, we have a relationship with the market, and the prices go down because we have lots and lots of uh, of, of supply and the demand is not growing at the same pace and that slows down or constrain our growth and then we have uh, another one another feedback loop saying that well resources also constrain so that be the availability of land and in this case we have the, the crop systems that that is uh, constraining the, the so well we cannot go we cannot have more cows so we cannot feed them right so that that's pretty much also slows down the and it's the relations in the market that, in this case, this very simple case, are constraining um, the growth of the, of the livestock. Uh, we are going to assess, uh, we decided, well, the disturbance or the shock that we want to include in the model is climate change. And we will take a very simplified view of it. We will just reduce the yields of crops and the yields of grassland. And, uh, of course, uh, this will result in less weight for livestock units and higher operational costs. We know that climate change might also have other effects in the animals itself, and we have, but we didn't look at, that, at those issues. Um, and I think we have both in for some reason. Um, so the two variables we were talking about uh, before that we look at uh, uh, outcome functions. So we look at the outcome function as a delivery of healthy and affordable food and economic viability. And the proxy variable, so something that we can quantify and give us an idea of how this outcome fun function is performing, is the beef production and the price uh, paid to the farm. And we, then we can use the model to conduct uh, experiments, like or, or to simulate what will happen if, and where we say, well, what will be the difference between having a um, shocks in weather? So, a couple of years with very bad weather or increasing weather variability. So what if actually the weather doesn't get uh, considerably worse, but it's just more unpredictable and it changes more. And then uh, this is, for example, the outcomes that we can get out of a model. So uh, you see the reaction to a moderate shock. Uh, you will see some, some changes in the, in the outcome function, but eventually that outcome function seems to go back to the previous trend. That is the, the, the domain of attraction uh, that we were talking before. And in this one, it seems like when you have an extreme shock, well, obviously, the, 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 the outcome functions and the behavior seems to move to a different domain of attraction. Um, interesting enough, well, this is what is happening in the, in the livestock side of the equation. And uh, we are interested to understand why is that happening. And, uh, the reason why is that happening is uh, related to what is happening actually in crop production. Obviously, if you have uh, severe weather conditions, that is directly going to affect the yields and the production of that year. However, if if the if the effect is not big enough, 
the farmers are just going to continue farming, and that gives us the opportunity to recover, and you see the prices eventually go back to the trend, or production goes back to the trend. While extreme shocks obviously mean that these people go bankrupt, and they cannot continue farming the way they're doing, and they stop doing it, and even they are able to recover, or, or some of them might be able to go back, you see that the domain of attraction change, and that also manifests in the price. That is eventually what is manifesting in uh, in this in this change in the in the production of of uh, livestock. Just because it's not as it's not as uh, profitable as would have been otherwise, and it's even though you can see what happened with price. Um, interesting enough is that when you know these, I think these results, especially this one, it looks quite intuitive. You know, well, we have a big shock, we have an um, issue with the outcome, and then it, it goes back to normal, that's expected, or if the shock is big enough, we'll probably will not be able to. But interesting enough is when you introduce weather variability, that you see actually the effects, although the, the, the change in the weather is less, actually the effects are worse, and uh, here we actually see changing uh, to a different domain of traction, the, the production of beef. And obviously the price, and uh, is this is uh, driven by fluctuations in the crop production that are affecting. So you see that it's not a, a dip in the production, but it's a steady decrease because those farmers that are less competitive are not able to to keep in the market. Um, so this is the the, the first uh, type of insights that we think we can gain from having this perspective to start to talk about resilience in terms of outcomes and try to describe or to associate some of the behaviors of these outcomes to how do we see resilience of the system as a whole. Um, we also think it could be helpful to, to discuss trade-offs. For example, well, we were testing the, the um, effect of climate change, where you see that uh, this would, the effect of climate change will be very different if we have a system that is very open to uh, to trade, like is the this case from this, you just import more food, and that is what is pretty much leaving the, the <coughs> farmers out of the market. While it will be um, less dramatic if we will have uh, a market that is very constrained into the into the just local production. Um, so well, this this brings a question of well, what do we do we want to do, and uh, and to discuss with stakeholders and policymakers. So well, do you want to be very resilient to climate change? Well, you might be open yourself to um, vulnerabilities in the commodity price because you will be more dependent, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, more dependent of the of foreign crops, for example, or do you want to be very resilient in terms of your livestock production, but probably the crops are going to be suffering and the people that are the farmers that are growing them are going to suffer. So we have just three points that we wanted to make or, or three uh, opportunities that we see in using the dynamic perspective. First is aggregate complexity and helps to make sense out of it. Uh, the models are transparent, small, easy to understand, easy to challenge and that helps to, to talk to not experts and to, and to other stakeholders. And third, we, we think that we can, we can help us to start trade-offs because we can simulate what will happen if and start to look from different perspectives and say, well, if you, if you improve these, you are, uh, you are affecting this other part of the system, so what do you want to do? And this probably is going to result in, in discussions about how to come up with a compromise and a, you know, a package of policies rather than a, a single one that is going to, to, to fit all. I think I ran out of time. I wasn't so short that I was done. Um, but if you have any questions, please. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Just do this.